As a chef, I always look for the very best red meat. That's why I love Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assured Beef. But what makes it so special? I'm on a journey to find out. Along the way, we learn why it's such a good source of natural protein, vitamins and minerals. You'll see how Northern Ireland Farm Quality Assured Beef is formed with the environment in mind. And why that logo guarantees world-class levels of responsible beef farming. Plus, I'll teach you some seriously easy and tasty recipes. So join me on my journey. Search Love NI Beef now. I'm on a journey to find out the truth about beef. Today I'm meeting Dr. Ruth Price to talk about the health benefits of beef as part of a balanced diet. So beef is packed with key nutrients for health, James. So we're thinking about things like, like protein, like omega-3, about B vitamins and iron, which are great for releasing energy in the body, as well as zinc, which is great for your immune function. Beef is a great source of natural nutrients, and I think that's the key. And many of these nutrients are a lot more available to the body because they're naturally present, which is great. So beef from a source you can trust is very good for a balanced diet? Very good for a balanced diet. After all that talk about health and well-being, I'm going to put together a superfood steak salad packed with nutrients. Remember to look out for that logo. It's your guarantee of responsibly produced world-class beef. Today I'm meeting Dr. Stephen Morrison to find out what impact beef production has on the environment. So Stephen, we'll get the big one out of the way first, the carbon footprint. How is beef affecting it? All food we produce and consume will come with a carbon footprint, and that's no different for beef. As you can see, animals around us, they will be producing emissions, but they are converting a product that we cannot consume as humans, in terms of grass, into an edible product. Our beef production systems are also capturing vast quantities of carbon, and that'll be in the soils we're standing on, but also in the trees and the hedgerows. Approximately a football pitch sized piece of grassland being farmed, will be capturing and storing the equivalent of the emissions from a, a UK car driven over a one year period. That grassland is, is providing that platform for those animals beside us here to really thrive and produce the beef we all love to consume. After spending time in the great outdoors, there's nothing better than a classic steak with garlic butter and wild mushrooms. Always look out for the logo when you're shopping. It's your guarantee of responsibly produced world-class beef. Good evening, everyone, and hopefully the, the, the images of those, those nice uh, dishes and that, uh, that, that prequel to our, our webinar tonight is hopefully whet your appetite for the evening ahead. But you're all very welcome to this, our fourth and final event of our, our beef webinar series of 2021. As you know, uh, the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, uh, the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise, the Northern Meat Exporters, Ulster Farmers Union, National Beef Association and ourselves here in LMC, We've all joined forces to deliver this series of topical and timely beef webinars with a focus on sustainable beef for the future. As Chief Executive of the Livestock and Meat Commission, I'll be your chair for tonight's webinar and hopefully tonight will demonstrate sustainable beef supply chain initiatives and practice. Um, the webinar will be designed to show how we uh, in the supply chain are responding to demands from customers and consumers for sustainable food. And we have a series of excellent speakers for you tonight from farming and processing businesses, as well as the support organizations within the supply chain. So just before we get on to our, our first speaker of the evening, just a few housekeeping notes and, and some instructions as to how you can engage with tonight's webinar. So as you know, you may have noticed when you when you logged in, tonight's webinar is being recorded and, and certainly after tonight, a link will be sent out to, you can watch again uh, if you want to pick up some information you don't perhaps pick up during the, the evening. Questions, we, we, we certainly would welcome questions to be submitted throughout the duration of the webinar and those will be picked up in a panel Q&A discussion at the end of the evening once everybody has, all the speakers have, have given their presentation. So those questions, if you go into the Q&A button, if you're watching on a laptop or computer at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. We'd invite you to, you know, uh, put any questions through that, that uh, mechanism when that goes up uh, and we'll put those to the panel discussion at the end. I say, if you're, if you're looking through a screen, um, it'll probably be at the bottom. If you're on a phone, it might well be at the top of your mobile device. 
There'll also be a survey as you leave at the end of the webinar. So I encourage everybody to, to complete that so we can continue to improve the offering that, that we make. So we expect the session tonight to last about an hour and a half. So about 9.30, we'll, we'll, we'll draw proceedings to a close and, and hopefully we'll, we'll, everybody will be well educated by then in terms of uh, this evening's webinar. And if there's any outstanding questions, we'll, we'll answer those afterwards. So with that quick introduction, we'll try and get the session underway. And the first speaker for tonight is, is Sarah Hare, uh, who'll be familiar to quite a few of you, I'm sure, on, on the call tonight. Sarah is Head of Agriculture for the Don Meats Group. She's worked in the agri-food industry for over 20 years across various areas, including production, agriculture, non-government organizations, retailing, animal welfare, and meat production. So she's now Head of Agriculture for Don Meats, which encompasses a very varied work stream across the Don Meats and the Don Bia business, uh, which most of you will be familiar with in a Northern Irish context. I say this role ranges from customer liaison and agricultural matters, all aspects of animal welfare from farm to factory, as well as agri-based projects looking at sustainable beef and lamb production in the UK and Ireland. So very much looking forward to, to Sarah's presentation. Uh, and I say, hopefully uh, you'll learn uh, something from uh, our, our excellent lineup of speakers tonight. So with that, I'll hand over to Sarah for our first presentation. Hopefully that will work. So uh, good evening, everybody. Um, a few familiar names on the uh, on the attendee list there. So uh, nice to virtually see you, even though I'm looking at a blank screen at the moment. Um, firstly, thank you to all the organisers for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I think it's been a great series so far, and hopefully we can do it justice this evening. Um, I've got a few slides. I don't want this to be deaf by PowerPoint at all. So um, hopefully the Q&A will uh, hope, allow us to share a few more thoughts. But if I can get technology to work. We should be seeing a screen now. So what I want to do, um, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm two different screens here, um, is just take you through a little bit of the journey that the Dawn Meets Group and Dunbury in particular in the UK context has been sort of challenged with over the number of years. And this is not a new topic by any means. And I just want to Give you a flavor of the some of the things we are doing as a business and what we're doing within industry to try and help everybody um, understand what we're trying to um, achieve. I've put a slide up there with lots of headlines. Um, it didn't take long to pick, pick some headlines there where climate change and sustainability are really driving a, a, an agenda, not just within the farming community, but in a much wider political context. And we've got COP26 in Glasgow um, that I don't think anybody can ignore at the moment, um, but it's, it's driving the narrative on this. And the opportunity that we have to, to tell our story is great, but the challenge that's facing us as well is, is equally great, if not greater. But it's something that we, we do have a good story to tell, but as you'll see as we go through the slides, we need to do a much better job at doing that. As I said, sustainability is not new. It's something that me personally and the roles I've had have been working on um, in, in various different roles, as Ian explained there. And, and our customers have been focused on this for at least 20 years. I can't say more than that because I've not been involved with them longer than that. But things like animal welfare, antibiotics, the intensive versus extensive debate, animal feed and more latterly the soya um, usage within that. They've been topics and areas that we've had work streams going on for a number of years, trying to understand the extent of the challenge, but also how we can help and, and move forward. They're all really important when we're talking about sustainability, because if we can't get those bits right, the, the, the rest of it will fall into place around it. So where are our customers sitting? Because ultimately, we're all working to deliver a quality product to a consumer. And that's through a number of the retail and food service customers that we have. You can see on the screen there that a lot of the retailers have got commitments. As a government, we've got commitments set for 2050, but a lot of the retailers are going further and quicker with targets of net zero by 2040. You will see challenges around 2030 as well in different guises. The, the phrases of net zero, climate neutral, climate positive are all terms that are banded around. And I think there's been an element of we know we need to do something, but we're not entirely sure how to get there. And that's the big challenge that we, we have. The science-based target initiative is one thing that a lot of the customers have, have leapt on, and we as a business have leapt on it too, because it's 
giving us a science-based approach to trying to tackle the problem. There's a lot of emotion around the climate topic, and I think that's distorting some of the narrative that we, we fundamentally need in the agricultural sector. So how are we tackling that challenge within Dumbia? <clears throat> well, I've got some pretty circles on the screen there. We have customer specific projects. All the customers that we work with have a real commitment to agriculture. And we, we do projects within that, whether that be around KPIs, whether it be the carbon thing, or whether it be more topical things about liver fluke, for example. So we have a number of um, customer specific projects, which is great, but they're generally small scale. Going up that, that circles um, diagram a little bit, we've got some wider industry projects and we sponsored projects like the NI Sheet program to help develop our learnings and insights and help share some of that back to farm level. We've also got Newford as a suckler demonstration farm in the west of Ireland, which has been going for seven years now, trying to look at the most sustainable beef and lamb supply chain opportunities that we have, which I think has been a great success for us, but there's only so far that we can go with the 100 cow herd. The other thing that we've got here is Farm Green, and it's great timing for this because we actually launched Farm Green yesterday as a communication tool to try and inspire sustainable farming. As I will come on to say it again, it's not new. This is stuff that we have all been doing, whether we're at farm level or in the supply chain for a number of years. We then pull up to the industry collaboration piece because no one can get to where we need to be on our own. I think this is the biggest fundamental change that I've seen in the industry in my time, is actually people working together and collaborating on trying to find solutions. And it's, it's really heartwarming to see competing businesses and competing supply chains looking to collectively together to solve the, pro the problem. And you'll see a number of uh, logos up there, whether it be the likes of Red Tractor or the um, Quality Assurance Scheme in Northern Ireland, Meet in a Net Zero World, which is um, organised by RAP, um, the UK Capital Sustainability Platform, which I'm fortunate enough to, to chair at the moment, and the European Roundtable, all coming together to try and have that dialogue. The challenge we have now is a dialogue, dialogue is great, but action is needed at, at grassroots level to try and move, move forward on it. <clears throat> so I've talked about the science-based target initiative. And as a business, we were the first European meat processor to set science-based targets. A very complex set of um, criteria that we had to fulfill to, to set a target. A lot of data we had to collect to, to do that. And we work with the Carbon Trust to in, enable us to, to do this um, effectively. And without going into too much detail on, on it, scope one and two apply to things within our own, our own uh, operations. So everything from the factory gate through whether it be livestock coming in, whether it be packaging coming in, they're all things that we can directly control within reason. And that's all to do with scope one and two. Scope three is our hardest challenge. And it's the hardest challenge anyone that's setting science-based targets has because it's us supply chain. And it's, it's you guys as farmers that have an impact on our scope three. So we want to work with our farming community to say, what can we do collectively to move the dial? And I'll come on to that in a minute. But just an example of some of the things we've done within our own business. And it takes a lot of investment to move some of these things forward. But it's great to see some of the highlights that we've pulled out recently in our sustainability report. The water save within our business has the equivalent of 1,225 Olympic swimming pools. Can't really visualize that myself, but that's, um, that's a quite an impressive amount of water that we've saved in an industry that's quite heavy on, on water use, especially for, from a hygiene and cleanliness point of view. Energy wise, we've saved enough energy to power 20,000, over 20,000 homes. And 100% of our electricity is sourced from renewable sources. They are just a few of the examples of things that we've done as a business to try and help and play our, our part in it. So I've talked about scope three being a challenge. So nearly 10 years ago, we were part of an organization called the SAI platform, which in 2017 became the European Roundtable for Beef Sustainability. That platform spent a number of years discussing what is sustainability? How do we define it? It's great to talk about it, but unless we can actually define it and put some um, content behind that statement, it's meaningless. So as, a, as an organization, 
um, which I again was fortunate to chair back in 2018-2019 um, and Ian Stevenson from LLMC is um, our chair this evening is also on the board of uh, ERBS. We came up with some outcome measures and the outcome measures you can see on the screen animal medicines, animal welfare, the farm management side of things and the environment are all things that I mentioned on the, the first couple of slides. These aren't rocket science things. There's no silver bullet for any of this, but to try and have some targets set that we could work to on a European basis gave us suddenly a single focus that we could say, actually, this is what sustainability means. From a UK point of view, we said, well, how do we do that? And the UK Cattle Sustainability Platform was formed to collect the evidence that we needed to demonstrate that we were actually not only on the road to delivering the ERBS targets, but actually in some cases already delivering them. And this comes back to my biggest challenge with the industry, that we're very good at saying we do a good job, but we are not very good at proving it. We don't necessarily have the mechanisms in place to co coherently talk about how good we are in some cases. We talk a lot about our antibiotic use, but without the likes of Rumour as an organisation to collate the information, we don't have a central body to, to talk coherently about what we do. And that's the challenge we, we, we all face. So hopefully through the work that we're doing with the UK Capital Sustainability Platform, we can actually bring some of that to life. So what can farmers do? Because I think the majority of this audience is farmer focused, which is great. It's not rocket science, as, I, as I've said. The key thing here is about actually measuring what we're doing. And we don't have to suddenly go out tomorrow and go, what do I need to measure? You've got a lot of data in front of you. You've got data in forms of traceability records, um, APHIS data. I mean, sitting in, a, <laughs> in an English seat here, I'm quite envious of what APHIS can do for, for, for Northern Ireland. Um, KPIs, calving intervals, um, how many live calves have you had born compared to um, how many cows were um, served, et cetera. They're all very simple bits of data, but pieces of data that actually sh sh show a huge amount of value to your own business, but also as an industry. We talk about carbon footprints as well. There's a lot of noise around which tool do we use and what do we, we do? And I think there's discussions around that at the moment, but even if you ignore all the noise around and say, I want to do a carbon footprint. There are tools available online to do it. Have a play, see where you fit. It may not be as scientifically accurate um, that government may need it in future years, but it'll give you a good starting point to understand what, where you may sit. Once you've got that information together, review it, sit down and understand what is that information telling you. And don't be afraid to ask for help either. This, start bit can get quite complex and people can get quite mesmerized by the information in front of you but there are more than enough organizations and resources out there to to help and advise and I think there's um there's a lot to be said for actually reaching out and asking for help the biggest challenge there is actually then implementing it saying that we need to change our genetics on farm saying we need to grow a bit more grass actually don't just talk about it do it and I think that that will ultimately um, get us in a really good position. What are the things that we can do? Um, I've just pulled out a few circles here. There's a number of reports done by industry experts and academics, but it doesn't have to get that complex. Improving your daily live weight gain, improving your animal health, inclusion of clover in plaster swords. And I think with the price of fertilizer and where that's going, I think that might be the quickest accelerator on, on this um, slide. Maternal traits, how many cows are actually getting in calf every 365 days? They're, they're simple things that as a production system, we should be on top of, and ultimately they will help um, further down the line. So none of this is actually too complex. But Tony Blair stood up um, many years ago and talked about education, education, education. Greta Thunberg is talking about blah, blah, blah. Sarah Hare is talking about measure, 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 because if we don't talk about measuring what we do, we can't manage it and we can't demonstrate it. And if you don't take anything else away from what I'm saying tonight, measure as much as you can. And you have it. You have it on weigh scales. You have it um, on 
plate meters or sword sticks, there are lots of information that you're already measuring, but use it, don't let it sit on the shelf. So this is a bit of a shameless plug for some of the work um, we're doing within Dumbia. As I said, we, meant we launched Farm Green yesterday. Uh, Farm Green is a multitude of um, social media activities and events that we'll be hosting over the next 12 months. Part of our agricultural strategy is based around five different pillars. The environment being the key one, animal health and welfare, animal feeds, meat quality and sustainable supply chains. They all interlink. They're not in isolation at all. Um, but we want to make sure that we have a sustainable supply chain to deliver a quality product to our customers. And I invite you all to uh, join us um, for our um, first webinar, which is about the importance of data. You'll hear some of the things echoed that I've just said <laughs> this evening. Um, but again, trying to simplify some of the noise that's going on around this topic. So I think that concludes my slide presentation for this evening. Um, I look forward to the conversation that we have, have later on. Um, and thank you very much, everybody. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that, Sarah. Uh, very informative. Uh, presentation certainly uh, sets the scene very well for the, the the session to come for the the rest of the evening and I'll just encourage you know as, as as you're tuning into the webinar tonight um if you have any questions please can you submit them through the Q&A uh, function uh, not not through the chat but if you can use the the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen or if, if you're using a phone perhaps at the top of your screen and certainly we'll try and pick up as many of those as we can at the end of the the webinar so with that, uh, thank you, Sarah, for that, that very informative introduction presentation. And um, certainly now we'll, we'll pass on to our, our next speaker for the evening, who's, who's Colin Smith. Uh, Colin is a, a colleague of mine uh, in the Livestock and Meat Commission. He's been Industry Development Manager with the organisation since, since 2012. As part of Colin's role, his overall responsibility for a wide range of, of business activities within LMC, um, from the, the, the Northern Ireland Beef and Lamb Farm Quality Assurance Scheme, which I'm sure if most of the farmers on, on, on the call tonight will be familiar with, and also to a broad range of activities under our, our sustainability work. Uh, and certainly that's what Colin's going to talk tonight about. So Colin also in, in 2018 uh, joined the Board of Animal Health and Welfare in Northern Ireland, and certainly you know, as a key aspect in, in consideration of, of sustainability of the industry as well. So. Uh, I'll hand over to you now, Colin, to, to take us through the, the next uh, part of tonight's presentation. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And um, hopefully everybody can see this and hear this, but I um, just want to thank you for the opportunity um, to speak with you all this evening. And um, really wanted to talk about um, two different projects that we've been looking at as an industry and uh, LMC has been working along with industry colleagues on. And I suppose, um, hopefully you'll see that they do respond to the, the challenge to, that Sarah had said, the challenge from the supply chain um, and customers and consumers for sustainable beef, but also the challenge that, that Sarah set out to measure, measure, measure. And that's certainly um, really key to what, uh, what I'm going to speak about um, this evening. So in terms of what we've been trying to do on, on the ground in Northern Ireland, um, we pulled together in response to these challenges, a sustainable beef project steering group. And um, essentially, uh, as Ian mentioned at, at, at the top of the, um, the webinar, a number of uh, representatives that um, you'll be well familiar with across the industry, um, between AFB, CAFRI, the Ulster Farmers Union, Department of Agriculture, and uh, Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association. Um, as a group, we've been seeing how we can, we can address the challenges that I suppose are coming our way. But primarily, the, um, the project that uh, this was really kicked the, kicked this off and got everybody around the table was um, the, the challenge laid down to, to look at whether we can be part of a, a grass-fed beef uh, initiative. I guess the, the, the Irish grass-fed beef PGI, which we, we were looking at at that time, um, was came from a, a submission that was made by Borbea and the Department of Agriculture, um, Food and Marine in, in, in South of Ireland, for a, protect, a protected geographical indicator for Irish grass-fed beef. And uh, you'll be familiar with PGIs, I'm sure, the likes of um, Scotch beef, Welsh lamb, or other examples. And um, 
Irish grass-fed beef is something that in, in Northern Ireland, both the, the, the department, um, government level and industry, wanted to see if we could um, then be part of that, that application, but on an all-island basis. And, and I, I suppose essentially to do that, um, we were challenged to um, cover those two first objectives that you can see there on the left-hand side of the screen, to design and develop and publish a grass-fed beef standard, first of all, and to meet the requirements of the Irish grass-fed beef PGI. And then once we have the standard, obviously, um, to, to give integrity to what we're trying to do is to design a, a grass-fed beef verification system that, again, meets those requirements of grass-fed beef and PTI. So what we certainly find when we, when we looked at uh, what we needed for the calculation for grass-fed beef was that a significant proportion of the information um, that we were hoping to gather, if we added some additional questions around that and um, added, um, gathered some additional information, we could then be in a place to baseline our carbon footprint uh, for beef producers across Northern Ireland. And that was a significant, um, I suppose a significant find in some ways that, that if we could get the systems up and running and if we could deliver that, that would um, put us on a, on a leading in, in, in many ways to, to respond to the, some of the challenges that, that Sarah set out. So tonight I really want to raise awareness um, amongst farmers of some of the plans we have in place and we hope to deliver over the next 12 months uh, in terms of meeting those challenges and, and indeed meeting the objectives that we set out as a group. And I suppose a high level schematic, a very simple schematic and how we want to do that, and I'll go into some more detail um, in, in, in a little while. But essentially this, this schematic looks at, um, with the red lines, the information that's going into the centralized database and the blue lines in terms of uh, outputs coming out from that. So in the top left, as Sarah mentioned, uh, the, the, the envy that they may have in GB for our, our traceability system or and, um, our APHIS system. So essentially one of the key elements of, of both grass-fed beef initiative and, and getting information for carbon calculations is um, animal data. So pulling that data in from a reliable source and accurate information is important. And um, I suppose in combining alongside that animal data, what we needed to do was um, ask additional questions and um, gather information to, to allow the calculations to take place. And as you all know, we have um, just over 12,000 members of the North Ireland Beef and Lamb Farm Quality Assurance Scheme here in Northern Ireland. And the key element of this project being successful is the, the efficient gathering of information in a timely, matter, uh, timely manner that doesn't add cost to, to the industry. So while we are out at a farm, uh, farm quality assurance inspection every 18 months, the, the plan is to add um, some additional questions at the end of your standard audit that would allow you then, um, as, a, as a beef enterprise, as a farm, um, to, to put information through the calculator and get outputs on the other side. And the outputs that we're looking at is uh, a beef carbon footprint for the beef enterprise and also a grass-fed um, status for an each individual animal that then could be um, used at process, processor level. And so just to give you some um, information, and I'll keep this very high level, and I know it's a bit of a busy slide, apologies for that, but I wanted to, again, raise awareness just about some of the areas that would be asking for information. So on the left-hand side, as I mentioned, the animal data coming from APHIS, now you'll see the categories that are broken down into. The reason that um, you're working with, with colleagues in AFBE to, to set out what categories that we'd need for the, the calculations, these are obviously to reflect the information that would come directly from AFIS so that it would align. Because I think what's critical to our project is that we can pre-populate, whenever we're out on farm, that we have pre-populated information on the animals that have been on your farm during the reference period. So um, let's say the 12 months of the previous calendar year. So if we have that information all sitting there ready for you, you don't have to think about, well, what animals have been on my farm in the previous year. And this, I should have mentioned, this is for the, the detail on the slide is for the, the greenhouse gas calculation or the carbon calculation. So on the right-hand side, you'd see some of the areas that would be lifting from the survey. And any of you that have been through the, um, the, the CAFRI work through your BDG that was mentioned at the previous webinar will, will be familiar with this. But those, for those of you who, who aren't necessarily, some of the information that we're lifting is, is land control for the beef enterprise uh, in terms of hectares controlled for the beef enterprise, percentage split for breeding cows and fattening cows, like different energy requirements that so we need that information, number of cows calved and um, date of, of first calving uh, is important. 
And I'll touch on why these areas are highlighted in, on the next slide, but you can see there we need information on turnout and housing dates, the crops produced on farm and the nutritive value for that. Um, forage offered at grazing and indoor, crops bought in and the, their nutritive value. Concentrates fed uh, is an important element. And then you will be familiar, of course, emissions coming from slurry, manure, fertilizer, and any lime applications on top of that. In terms of use of contractors, uh, it's the diesel we're looking at in terms of what, what's being used by contractors. And then there, there, there are other elements that are maybe less important to the overall greenhouse gas calculation, but important non nonetheless. Um, electricity, fuel, plastic, battery products usage. Um, land use change is another important factor if, if things have changed from um, permanent grassland, for example, to, uh, to cropping or vice versa. And then on the sequestration piece, um, area of hedge grows that are on farm and, and the trees grown. And lastly, then information, we'll be asking for information on the sheep that are co-grazing with, with the uh, beef cattle to, I suppose, remove the influence of sheep on the, the beef calculation. So this is just to show you that this is the grass fed, the information that's required for grass fed. And you can see on the left hand side, all of the same information is required in terms of animal, animal data. And on the right hand side, and that was previously highlighted in the previous slide, you can see the crossover to do the greenhouse, or sorry, the grass fed calculation, turnout and housing dates, crops produced on farm, forage offered at grazing and door, crops bought in and concentrates fed. So you can see why as a, as a grouping, an industry grouping that we, we chose to take these two projects together in tandem because of the significant crossover in, um, in information that's required. So as I, as I mentioned, just to, to remind you then, um, once you've gone to the effort of answering those questions out the other side, you'll be able to have access to grass fed status for each animal permitted into the layerage available on Bovis. Um, and that's for the processor then to segregate that and separate that from um, non, non grass fed beef. Uh, on from the farming end, you'll have a carbon footprint for the beef enterprise um, sent out and then uh, grass fed status producers will also be able to access the grass fed status of, of their animals. Um, and just quickly to say in terms of the Irish grass fed beef PGI that a board B and Daphne had put forward. There's not just requirements for producers, also requirements for post farm gate at the processor level. Um, and essentially both producers and processors must conform to the grass fed beef standards. In the specification that has been put forward for the, the PGI, there are a list of, of um, a list of requirements for processors to, to meet within that specification. You can see the carcass categories outlined on the on the slide there. Um, and there are also, a, I suppose, a long list of, of other requirements for processors that um, are designed to ensure that the beef um, go, going through the, the processing unit is, is uh, of, of the highest quality. Because um, that's, that's what it's all about in terms of PGI, that point of difference. So there are requirements. I'm not going to, to detail all of those tonight at the, in terms of the processor requirements, but just to say that they're there as well. And I suppose just to say at the minute, the issue that we have is in Northern Ireland is currently excluded from the geographical scope of the PGI application. And that's why we've been working very closely with the department in the south um, and stakeholders in the south, in the south particularly Board Bia, to get the stage where we have the systems in place um, to be able to go forward on an all island base, basis for the application of the PGI. Um, so I just want to mention very quickly some of the requirements from a producer point of view for the grass fed standard and ultimately those first four rules on the screen are are very straightforward the producer must be a member of fqas um, they, they must use the verification system that, that we're designing um, and have all of the data inputs that were asked for that the data collected is is collected as part of an fqs audit and um, all of these keep the integrity of this system in place and that the information must be available for the animal's lifetime. Rules five and six then are critical um, in that they're the, they're the real crux of the grass-fed standard. And uh, as it says there, meat from eligible animals must only be classified as grass-fed with a grass-fed verification database determines a minimum of 90% of beef consumed on a fresh weight basis is grass or grass forage. And then on top of that, um, the animals must be permit, um, permitted to graze outdoors on the grass for a minimum of 220 days per year during their lifetime. And I'm, I'm sure we will discuss this at questions um, when, when you see the, the 220 days requirement, but 
just to let you know that there is tolerance for up to 40 days and um, whether where certain conditions are met. And uh, I, I suppose because we were joining an application, the 220 days that were put forward to the European Commission as part of the requirement for the PGI, that was already put in place um, when we uh, when we started this process. But we can talk about more of that during the, the question and answer session. So just in terms of um, timelines and, and where we're at, um, in terms of the on-farm survey, we've been working closely with AFPI to really refine that um, and work with the, the scientists in AFPI to gather the information that, that's critical uh, and do that really efficiently to try and make sure that the time spent on audit is, is as low as possible and um, the time spent on farms low, low as possible. And we've been doing that with a number of farmers at this point in time. In terms of the, the data processing and the calculators available, we have systems in place that can complete the calculations that are required. We have web services designed and agreed, um, just need final sign off this month. Uh, and these will, those will go into, into development. And then we do need some additional consultation in terms of the output to mean, make sure there's a consistent message going out. Sarah mentioned about acting and measuring and then reviewing. So we need to make sure there's consistent messages out there in terms of what farmers can actually do, especially in the greenhouse gas calculation front. So a communication plan is critical. It's more straightforward for the grass fed because it's a yes, no, is your animal grass fed or not? So in terms of timeline, um, we hope to have the system ready for testing in August, 2022, and then go live um, around this time of next year. So just to conclude, um, you know, a key priority in, in this project, you can you can see and from what Sarah has said, we're looking to measure, measure, measure. And we're looking to do this as efficiently as possible when gathering information. And, you know, I, th I think that's critical to, to reduce the cost to industry. But we must, you know, we must continue to evolve and meet the demands of the supply chain. I think that that's clear. And um, I suppose Sam will, 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 will give you an idea uh, in, 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 in what um, his experience is on his farm and his own views on, on this. And I suppose in Northern Ireland, I think we've got an opportunity here with the systems that we have in place and the systems that, that we've mentioned tonight to, to collaborate across the supply chain and take a really positive step on this uh, beef sustainable, sustainability journey. And you know, doing this work, as I see, it's not just a lifeline in the wake of any proposed legislation and the like, but I see it as really an opportunity to lead the way um, to produce sustainable beef here in Northern Ireland. So Ian, um, that's all I have for tonight. So. Thank you again for the opportunity and um, look forward to any, any questions uh, and the like um, later on. Okay, thank you very much for that, uh, Colin. Certainly a, a lot of information there to digest around, you know, how we actually do some of that, that measurement on farm in order to get some of the, I suppose, the verifiable evidence that we need to, to substantiate um, the likes of the grass fed and, and, and carbon auditing. Um, but certainly in terms of um, the next part of our, our presentation, um, you'll hear from, I suppose, a farmer that hopefully will be familiar to, to, to most people on, on the call tonight from Sam Chesney. Sam's going to uh, give you a brief overview of the, the practicalities of putting what, what Colin was talking about and, and the practice on the ground. And, and certainly for those of you that don't know Sam Chesney, Sam is, uh, is a farmer from Kirkcubbin in County Down. Um, where he farms 200 acres, running 130 cows up the herd with bulls chosen for their high genetic merit. He also has 100 commercial ewes and in addition manages over 50 blade integrated beef calves. You know, you, you'll all be familiar, I suppose, in, in terms of some of the, the, the I suppose, the achievements on, on Sam's farm. He's certainly a very proud and, and passionate farmer from Northern Ireland, but he's got significant recognition for his efforts. He was the UK Beef Farmer of the Year. Uh, hard to believe, 10 years ago now in 2011. He was the Ulster Grassland Farmer of the Year in 2011 and 2013. He's also runner-up as British Grassland Farmer of the Year in 2012 and Grassland Manager of the Year in, in 2020. He's also been Danske Bank Beef Farmer of the Year and, and, and in our own programme, he was Quality Assurance Farmer of the Year in 2013. Uh, and certainly just this year in 2021, he was awarded a fellowship of the Royal Agricultural Society, which um, was certainly very well uh, achieved. So Sam says is familiar to us all. We're going to show a short video that Sam recorded out on his farm and, and, and Sam will be uh, joining us on the panel later on. I know we've a number of questions that have been coming in. Sam will hopefully get your, your views on those uh, and um, certainly in terms of your experience with the, the pilot that you did with Colin on, on the issue that, that we just talked about. So hopefully we'll, we'll, if, if the technology works, we'll, we'll see a, a short video from, from, from Sam.
You're, you're all very welcome to uh, this lovely part of the Arts Peninsula, Kirkcubbin. Uh, my name's Sam Chesney and we farm 130 suckler cows, um, 100 breeding ewes and some blade calves on 200 acres. Um, we're very conscious of how our consumers see uh, beef and sheep farmers. Um, so our cows are all put to easy calving bulls uh, to provide the quality beef that the consumer demands. The big issue coming around the corner for most of us is carbon and, and carbon footprints. And we're here really trying to reduce it to show people how responsible we can be. Colin has outlined a new beef initiative and I have trialled this project with him. It was very, very easy to do. It only took me 25 minutes. Um, the LMC sent me a list of topics they wanted to cover prior to my meeting and we ran through the whole thing in 25 minutes. Now this would be in addition probably to our farm quality assurance inspection um, and it's nothing to fear from the majority of beef and sheep farmers who feed a bit of silage in the winter and a bit of, a bit of concentrate. Um, but it's important that we embrace this. It's no longer good enough to say that Northern Ireland produces the best beef in the world. It's no longer good enough to say Northern Ireland is the most sustainable place in the world. The consumers need proof of this, and this goes a long way to helping us do that. Um, so with the help of LMC and a quality assurance inspection, um, and a few extra minutes of time, I think this is the way forward. Um, we need to be out there um, setting our stall out for the rest of the world to show and prove that Northern Ireland beef and lamb is the most sustainable, environmentally friendly um, and quality in the world. Thank you for that, uh, Sam, and, and certainly I know once we have our, our panel discussion, we'll, we'll hopefully pick up on, on some of the points that you, the important points that you raised there, and, and certainly you're, you're, you're a natural out on, on your farm there, talking about you know, what you do and, and what you do very well, so I say we'll, we'll pick up on, on the conversation, and I say well, we're now coming on to our, our last sort of speaker of the evening, so please keep the, the questions coming in through the Q&A. Uh, panel, there's been been a good number come in. So if you've got any any questions you want to ask to direct to any of our panel members, please please continue to feed those in through the Q and A uh, section. So I move on now to the, the final speaker uh, before our panel discussion, uh, Connell Donnelly from the Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association. Um, again, we'll probably be familiar to, to quite a few of you. Um, Connell. Um, uh, as chief executive of NEMEA, it's a trade body that represents the beef and lamb processors uh, across 11 different sites here in, in Northern Ireland. Um, the meat exporters uh, support the beef and lamb industry on uh, technical, economic and supply chain issues and its members have significant processing interests right across the British Isles um, with several key players headquartered here in Northern Ireland. I know certainly Sarah earlier on, our, our company is a, is a member of NEMEA as well. Um, Connell, in, in his role, is, is involved in developing the organization's position on a variety of technical and policy areas, including trade, access to labor, and agricultural policy. Uh, and certainly, you know, there's probably uh, nobody, I would say, on the call tonight who's more knowledgeable in the ins and outs of, of Brexit than, than Connell over the last number of years. So, so Connell, um, I'll maybe pass over to you uh, just for a few uh, final comments before we, we go to the panel uh, discussion and then hopefully pick up on some interesting points that have been coming in in the Q&A. So over to you, Connell. Thank you very much, Ian. And, and uh, it was really interesting listening to all of the um, um, speakers, um, some really interesting uh, comments. And I expect that a lot of what I say will chime with um, a lot of the points that have already been made. And um, I have a lot of sympathy with a lot of the comments I see coming up, particularly around um, uh, the, you know, the 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 focus that's on on the on the red meat sector in particular. I, I actually have been reflecting this week on the commentary in the press in the run up to uh, COP twenty six in Glasgow, and there was two articles on the BBC homepage website on Monday and Tuesday of this week that jumped to mind. The first headline was six ways to tackle climate change, and that appeared on the BBC homepage on Monday along with a picture of someone eating a burger. And the story was about ways that the UK government can address climate change and included policy solutions on 
things like subsidised heating, carbon taxes, street lamp charging, as well as cutting meat and dairy consumption. And then on Tuesday, I opened the BBC homepage again and was greeted with another climate change headline. What is net zero? And this time the headline was accompanied by a picture of a herd of cattle standing in front of a window. And, and when I clicked on that story, uh, I found a chart that showed the transport and energy accounted for 48% of emissions and the businesses and homes accounted for 32% of emissions and agriculture and all of agriculture, mind you, not just cattle and sheep, accounted for just 10% of UK emissions. And then I thought again about the two pictures that were used to illustrate those two stories on, on the BBC, the homepage of the BBC website, one of a burger and one of a herd of cattle. Yet the stories weren't just about agricultural emissions, each of those stories were about the broader climate issue. And so I know that the industry, farmers in particular, are fed up with the portrayal of beef and dairy production as greenhouse gas polluters. At times, I have to say it feels like a siege. And I know farmers are, are feeling just as dismayed and angry at this portrayal as, as we are. After all, our beef industry's carbon emissions uh, are estimated to be two and a half times lower than the global average. We are starting from a much more sustainable position than many of our global counterparts. So when I've spoken with farming colleagues about the need to drive a sustainability agenda through the supply chain, the farmers I speak to are very enthusiastic because they want to be able to fight back. They want to show that this is the best place in the world to produce beef and lamb. And as Sam said in his video, the problem is that it isn't just enough to say it. Um, the Brazilians, the Argentinians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, they're all saying the same thing. And I suppose our response is, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? And being no doubt, others will say the same thing about us. So it isn't just enough to say it. As Sam said, we have to prove it. Our customers are asking for the evidence. And government's passing climate legislation. And that's going to be followed by a climate action plan for each industry sector. We can wait for someone else to write the script for the agricultural sector, or we can collaborate and write a climate action plan that delivers for the environment and food for the nation. Ultimately, the future is going to require measurement and reduction of carbon emissions on farms with the twin objectives of reducing emissions and improving efficiency. And the good news is I don't see anywhere better in the world to do this. In fact, I believe that we can be global leaders on this front. And Colin Smith outlined in his presentation some of LMC's work on this to date. And it'll be essential in feeding in on that front. We have been global leaders in the past. The Farm Quality Assurance Scheme was one of the first in the world, and it led the way across the UK as a supply chain initiative. And we're fortunate in Northern Ireland to have world-leading research capacity in AFPI, the Institute of Global Food Security, a government knowledge transfer service in CAFRI, a quality assurance scheme that can act as the basis for carbon audit delivery across all farms. We have the potential of a livestock genetics program, and an effective, a very effective animal health and welfare program. Deer's agricultural policy can complement the industry's work, and we have a very supportive minister. We have excellent people. We have excellent supply chain initiatives. We have wonderful IT systems, and Sarah mentioned that AFIS is the envy of the rest of the UK. We have a wealth of data, and we have systems as well like Bovis. And if we have the wherewithal, and I can see this emerging, if we have the wherewithal to work together and remove fragmentation across different supply chain initiatives, organizations, and sectors as well, we have to work with the other sectors. We can make tremendous progress and make this at the same time a relatively straightforward process for farmers. But collaboration has been mentioned a lot tonight, and we must maximize collaboration. And if we can deliver on that win-win, and I think this is key, the win-win of reduced emissions and increased efficiency, we will demonstrate to our customers, government and broader society, that feeding the nation 
with Northern Ireland beef and lamb and reducing our carbon footprint are two entirely complementary outcomes. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that, Connell. Um, certainly some, some, some food for thought um, there and, and, and certainly um, something we, we might want to pick up on in our, in our panel discussion. So certainly that, um, that now concludes the, um, I suppose the formal presentations for this evening. And as I say, keep, keep your questions coming in. I'll maybe ask our, our, our panel members, uh, I don't know if you want to they'll all turn, your, turn your cameras on and, and we can have a, a general discussion and pick up on some of the, 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 the questions are starting to come in thick and fast now, which is, which is good to see. So I'll, I'll try and direct the, the relevant questions to um, each of you as we go on. I know there's certainly some questions for, for the whole panel uh, to, to pick up on. So I'll maybe uh, go back uh, to yourself, Sarah, from, from the first presentation. There were a, a couple of questions come in just as, as you were presenting. And, and certainly one really, I suppose, was the, the first question around What's the cost of sustainability? You know, I know we, we've talked a lot tonight about the value in sustainability and, and why we want to do it, but, but certainly I suppose it, it, it's a theme that has come in a number of the questions, you know, with, with processors and retailers, you know, seeking ever increasing sustainability credentials, you know, how's, how's that going to be paid for? Are farmers going to be asked to produce sustainable produce for sustain, unsustainable farm gate prices? And, and is sustainable food undervalued? I suppose it was, it was one of the first questions that came in this evening. I think you've, you've packed a lot into that, Ian. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the, the value and the cost side of things is, is always a, a challenge, and I'm not going to do the normal sort of bat it away, but the reality is a lot of the things I talked about within a farm gate should actually help the financial performance of the farm. If you can produce more, whether that be kilos of beef, heads of cattle or whatever it might look like on, on your individual farm, that's got to be a positive for the bottom line. So take, take the rest of it away. It's controlling what you can control within your own footprint. Prices will vary of inputs. That's as, as long as um, anyone's around doing what they do, fertilizer prices, feed prices, the weather, they're all things that none of us can control. And I think we're seeing exacerbations of some of those prices with the political climate that we're in at the moment. So I think there's an element of saying, let's take a step back and say, what can we control? So from a, from a Dunbeer point of view, we've done the same. We've said, what can we control within our operational side of things? And that's where some of the headlines have come that I presented tonight in terms of water savings, energy savings. Farmers can do exactly the same things and it all should have a positive. Some things will need investment, infrastructure. We, Everyone appreciates that, that how things are today may not be quite how they need to be for the future, but actually being more efficient across every part of the supply chain is a win-win. When it comes to what our customers are expecting, they're expecting us to deliver this. They have their own targets. We are part of their supply chains. At the end of the day, we all sort of, and I cast myself in this because I'm a farmer too, we're producing beef and lamb off our farms because in the main, we enjoy doing it. You wouldn't go out and do be a farmer if you didn't enjoy it. But at the same time, we've got to remember we're producing food and we are food producers and part of the food supply chain. And as, as I think every speaker has said, working together is something that we need to collectively do. And it's not something that we've been great at. And it's one of the challenges as a supply chain that we face in beef and lamb. You look at the pig and poultry supply chains that are a lot more joined up and can paint a very positive picture. There's no reason why we couldn't do the same thing. And the value will be released once we can do that to every part of the supply chain. And if we can ultimately sell our consumers the product that they want, that's the, the ultimate goal. Okay, thanks for that, Sarah. And another question that, that came in um, during, during your presentation was, and, and uh, I could probably answer it myself as, as having been involved in it at, at the time through the site platform and the RBS. But um, you, you showed a slide that mentioned all animals having access to loose housing by 2030. 
is loose housing something that is going to become more and more important in terms of the environment? And, and maybe you want to explain what that means in terms of loose yeah. housing. I sometimes think this is misinterpreted in terms of what that actually means. It, it, it's very much misinterpreted and it's probably the, the fault through that we've collectively have any RBS of how we communicated this. But the loose housing um, outcome measure there was actually a, another way of talking about tethering as a, um, a production uh, system. Bearing in mind we were talking in a European context and the majority of livestock in some of the European countries are tethered as a standard housing practice. So actually when you take this back into a, a, a UK context, we're in a great position. So we actually should be turning around saying, no, we have predominantly grass fed animals. The, the presentation that Colin did um, is sort of shouting about that as well and how can we demonstrate that and verify it. So, um, I wouldn't get too worried about that. This is one of the good things where we've actually set a, an outcome measure that we can achieve and demonstrate um, accordingly. One thing we don't really have is the, the evidence to say how many animals are tethered because we're not really collecting that housing data. But the, the information that we can, can glean from, from various sources gives us a, a really positive uh, picture on that. So I think the housing thing is, is misinterpreted from the, the ERBS outcome measure point of view, but you could take that into this sort of more intensive, extensive debate that has been ongoing for, for years. But ultimately, coming back to the sustainability thing, we grow a natural product called grass that no one else can convert into a product as good as beef and lamb. And we need cattle and sheep to do that for us. Thanks, Thanks for that, Sarah. And certainly, I think if you, you travel around the country at the moment, you know, grass has been, been in plenty of supply, certainly into this, this late autumn. Um, I'll maybe ask this next one to, to you, Sam. Um, you know, it was again part of Sarah's presentation, and um, you know, it's come in a number of questions about the, the measure, measure, measure comment that that, that was made during the, the the presentation from Sarah. And, and certainly, I suppose from from your own perspective, um, you know, being involved in CAFRI benchmarking in terms of your physical performance on the farm, and you know, the carbon efficiency equals financial efficiency sort of discussion, I suppose, that we're, we're trying to have tonight. You know, how, how do you feel about that in terms of measuring and monitoring and, and just in terms of that, that measure, measure, measure comment on just how important that is? Well, Ian, uh, I think it's very important that farmers get a grasp of this. I actually had a busload of young degree students from Greenmount this, this afternoon, and I try to emphasise the point that, you know, if you don't measure your grass, you don't know how much you're grass you have, you don't know how much grass you can take out of the system. You need to know uh, your calving indexes. If your cows aren't performing, they're not producing the, amount, the right amount of live weight on the calves. You, you have to know these details. It's no longer um, it's no longer the right thing to do to just buy cattle and throw them out to a field. You need, you need to know these things. It's becoming more technical every day. Um, this initiative that, that we're hopefully embarking on, um, it's not maybe for everybody. I don't envisage every single animal in Northern Ireland being eligible for the grass-fed the grass-fed beef scheme. It's another way of looking for another market um, somewhere else in the world. It's getting cattle out of the system um, and hopefully sustaining the price or increasing the price we're getting for the cattle that remain in the system. We produce beef in Northern Ireland, as you know, for the highest paid market probably in the world was the GB and the grass fed thing would be just topping up. But we have to do this, Ian. Um, as I said, it's no longer, it's no longer good enough for us to say, you know, you know, we are, we think we're sustainable. We think we think we know the figures without proof. <laughs> without proof, we have nothing. Um, you don't know where your business is going. Um, are we doing the right thing without measuring you you can't you can't decide that. I'm going to just pick up a wee bit maybe further on that. It was the, it was the next question that came in from, from one, of, one of our participants tonight saying that they were a lover of the, the push towards measure to manage better. You know, but they're asking the question, how, how do we promote this message on the ground amongst farmers? You know, there's still a, a significant percentage of people out there that this was a, the term, an ideology that, that, that doesn't reach. You know, just how, suppose how do, we, how do we get that message better out onto the ground and get more people doing it? You know, everywhere start, we go. Start with you, Sam, and then it's sort of my yeah, sorry. And Connell and Colin, maybe just for your, your thoughts as well. Everywhere we go, um, the green issue is there. Um, we may not like doing all this extra work, and it's not really extra. It's not. It's not hard. 
Um, but we have to do that if we want to have an industry going forward. Um, we've underlined all the good things we have in Northern Ireland. APHIS is a, is a godsend for all this pre-population of all the data that we need. Um, we just have to do it. Um, everybody else, you know, you can get a, a carbon-free mortgage from a bank in Northern Ireland. You can get a, a, a carbon-free insurance premium for your car. Um, the consumers are really into this and they want to know where their, their beef is. They want to know how, how carbon-free it is or how much carbon is producing a kilo of beef. And they want to know if it's grass-fed or not. And we have to, we have to produce what our consumers want. And, um, but we deserve to get paid for it. Uh, and we will. And we will. Thanks for that, Sam. Sarah, I'm going to ask for your, your thoughts on, on that. Yeah. The <laughs> I mean, there's, the there's an element of um, sort of teaching old dog new tricks type of thing. And uh, having sat with, with my father and gone through his medicine records for his red tractor audit recently um, and scraps of paper left, right and centre, um, you, <laughs> you're sort of preaching to converted with a question. But ultimately, we all have a responsibility to play our part, whether it be through advisory services, which I think are gonna become more and more important. And I mentioned in my presentation about asking for help. As an industry, we need to provide those, those sources of help to, to bring those um, everybody along and, and everyone together because there's an element of technology will help, help do this. I mean, apps and way cells and all this sort of thing, they all link together, but that's not appropriate for some people either because it's we, we are dealing with a generation that is, um, and an aging population of farmers. And I think we can't get away from that. There is a the next generation that's really, really important. And I think we can um, use our education system to, to help that. But at the same time, we've got to bring everybody along with us. And I think that those outreach advisory services are gonna be essential to that because I mean, I can talk to them blue in the face and say, you should do something, but it's actually sitting down with someone saying, this is how you do it at farm level is, is what we're probably, missing at this present moment in time. Thanks for that, Sarah. Colin, have you any thoughts maybe to, to add to that? Not too much to add. I mean, Ian, we said it earlier on, Northern Ireland is, is an excellent position because we have, we talked about systems, but we have, uh, Colin mentioned the advisory service, Sam mentioned it in his piece. You know, we saw the last webinar, Sinead, and working with Bill, um, but not just in isolation with, with, with other advisors covering different, um, different topics. You know, and it's, a, it's an excellent service. And, um, you know, it's it's free to farmers in Northern Ireland. So we have that there. It's it's encouraging people to reach out and use that. And do you want to, I remember Jim Freeburn at a, a conference a number of years ago. And, you know, he, he stood up and talked about the messages actually haven't changed in some technologies that much for whether it's the 20 years that Sarah has been working in the industry or whatever it might be. But so I think we just have to continue to batter away and try and get farmers to to pick up this technology and with the business development groups and the like, the research coming off about it out of AFP complementing that, I think we have the organizations here and um, farmers like to hear from other farmers, the likes of Sam, technology demonstration farms, that's what people like to hear. So I think we just need to continually work that because we need to, this is, some of this is gonna be new. So we need to get that message out and we have a role there as well, Ian, in the communication that we do. We have a big communication plan to do off the back of this to get people, people that have been into farm quality assurance for 25 years will know what they need. But they, there's new elements here and we need to continue to work work on that. Okay, and Connell, I know you mentioned, I suppose, just collaboration and, and supply chain partnerships and I suppose the importance of that. And I think that all feeds into that, that same sort of discussion. But Moody, any, any thoughts you have on, on, on I suppose, getting the, the ideology out on, on the ground in terms of trying to get people engaged and, and, and measuring them? managing yeah well, i think i think the collaboration piece is key i think um there's you know there's excellent work going on, um, going on across a whole range of um fronts we see obviously our members are upper, uh, operating in this area um you've had projects like the um don don via um project with the farmers journal on sheep um and caffrey um you have the the, the, the similar project that, that on, on the, the Suckler Beef Programme or the Better Farms Programme um, with ABP. You have, uh, um, you know, obviously you have the, um, the advisory services more generally in the business development groups. And from what I understand, there's evidence coming out to show the effectiveness of the business development groups, um, you know, is, is, is very strong. Um, 
and uh, you know probably more investment in that uh, would be valuable. Um, I think the big thing in all of this is that there's a win-win. Um, you know, we can't ever get away from that. Um, the the greenhouse gas implementation partnership was a was an excellent kind of strategy that operated for the last seven or eight years of the you know the the previous uh, um, agricultural policy program and a rural development program and the entire focus on uh, on measurement was around creating the win both for the environment and for the bottom line and I think I think that's the that's what we have to promote because um, I think I think everybody will will see the um, you know the pressures that are going to arise in the industry with increasing competition globally um, and also the increasing demands on on the industry to produce in a sustainable way and uh, and the way to the way to tackle that is is ultimately to become more efficient because we're more efficient with carbon we'll be more efficient with uh, um, financially as well. Thanks for that, Colin. There was a then, I suppose, when, when we moved on, then, Colin, you, you had obviously given us a, a good presentation there in terms of the, the grass fed beef and, and the carbon auditing. There was sort of a, a wee cluster of questions sort of come in really around some of the, the technical details in terms of, I suppose, how we envisage the grass fed status being, being verified. And then there were a number of sort of technical questions around. You know sort of you know animals with you know more than four moves you know in terms of their eligibility for example um you know 220 days at grass do they have to be consecutive and and sort of and, and a, i suppose a final one there around the is it will it be a, a compulsory bolt on to foreign quality assurance i suppose in order to retain your foreign quality assurance certification i can i can repeat any of those but just there was a weak cluster there of just those technical queries just around how how that mechanism might might work in practice, um, just in terms of that that verification process and, and some of the, the the technical aspects of it. Yeah. Um. So in terms of verification, in the the grass fed um standard and how that is verified in the verification system is robust, and I think it needs to be um to give that in, in integrity. So there's verification from a producer end, and I suppose that's done by uh. You know, an auditor like like we use at um, Foreign Quality Assurance, where it's an independent um, IS, you know, meeting the European standard ISO 17065 um, certification body, and they will be asking the the questions required. Some of the ones which I like outlined in, um, to to allow that to be independently verified in terms of the answers. You know, so we're asking questions around turnout dates, housing dates, concentrates fed, additional forage fed, crops brought in, crops, crops produced, for example. So all of those will be looked at, checked and verified independently. Um, and then likewise, at the processing end, um, there will be an audit at the, within, the, within the processing setup to see, to make sure that the, the product is labeled correctly, it's traced through the system, uh, it's segregated correctly, that, you know, Anything that goes under the grass-fed PGI is grass-fed, for example, you know, and that, and that would be common. You know, that's nothing new to the processing sector, I would imagine. So that's that's where the kind of independent verification comes in, Ian, to give it that integrity. Um, in terms of, I think there was a question there about um, calves, non non FQA farms, and uh, just in, you you mentioned there about four residences. I don't. It's um, I think that was just rule four they mentioned as opposed to. There's not a rule around. Rule four the there's not a rule around residencies. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll not we'll not not go back to that one. So that's that's nothing to do with 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 grass fed. But what I will say is that within the calculation, the first nine months of the animal's life is excluded from the calculation. That's um that's built into the grass fed standard. So therefore, the the, the participants' concern there around the um the sucker calves uh, sucker seals ruled out as as a result of that. So. The calculations start from uh, from nine months or for ten months onwards, I should say. So uh, hopefully that's um, reassuring in that respect. Um, around the two hundred and twenty days, whether it needs to be consecutive, the way that the, the grass fed status has worked out is actually there's a weighting given to each um, each grouping or cohort. So at an audit, you're asked um, say for animals between not and one year old when they're turned out and when they're housed, um, and say that gives. 220 days that's that's divided into the total days in the year and that's given a weighting 
um, and, and, and therefore each each cohort or each group is giving a, given a weighting. So um, it's, it's quite hard to explain. I have, I have other slides on that, didn't get a chance tonight, but rather than it's not counted consecutively, you know, so even though that animal might be um, have moved farms and might be in the wintertime, it's still given credit, as it were, for the time it has spent at grass because, um, you know, um, because of that weighting system. So hopefully get a chance to communicate these in and time. Um, but uh, let me see. So will will a bolt on uh, to FKS be compulsory? So the way that the FKS board has uh, has proposed and, and agreed at this point in time is that the the additional information that we're requiring, um, we will be asking our FKS members to give that. That will be mandatory to to answer those additional questions. However, you won't get a non-conformance. For example, it won't impact your your ordinary FKS certification status but members will be asked for the additional bold on information. So that's um, that's the way that we plan to do that. And so hopefully I've, I've chalked off some of the questions there, um, but happy to, to clarify anything else. No, I think that, that was very helpful and, and indeed I misinterpreted one of the questions there myself. So I'm glad you sort of picked up rule of four as opposed to my, <laughs> my misreading of the question there. So, but uh, as I say, it is, it is quite a technical process, but you know, the, I suppose the whole, the whole idea is trying to make it as simple as possible, you know, through the use of, of APIS and other technology that, you know, when we get out onto the farm, as, as Sam said earlier, you know, it, it doesn't take a huge amount of time to participate in, in the process. Uh, but I say we, we may come back to that later on in some of the questions. I'll maybe ask Connell, um, you know, and, and interesting, you mentioned New Zealand, I think, in, in terms of maybe one of the international competitors, just when you, you were talking uh, in, in your uh, you know, in your, in your, your talk tonight, and, and as a question has come in just about the, the New Zealand trade deal, um, I suppose it was done today, you know, between the UK and, and, and New Zealand, just in terms of, you know, just what um, what implications maybe we see from that, and I suppose that's coming, I suppose, not long in the back of a, a deal that's been done with Australia as well, maybe just some some thoughts you might have on that, and I suppose from a, from a supply chain perspective, I guess, which we're focusing on tonight, just, you know, how we maybe see these types of deals and, and the implications of these types of deals going forward? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously a concern that the UK government is is uh, is in such a hurry to do these kinds of deals. Um, um, you know, the Australian deal is supposed to speak about first. I mean, one of the big frustrations about it was that, you know, when we think about what we have to do in the supply chain here um, and what we're talking about tonight uh, was that they done, uh, you know, in the process of doing that deal, they dropped a, a requirement for net zero uh, um, during the negotiations. And, you know, I know the Ulster Farmers Union, in concert with the um, National Farmers Union, had been uh, involved in the Trade and Agriculture Commission. And one of the big asks there was that, you know, imports would be held to the same standard as we produce. Uh, at here. So to me, there's a need for an increasing focus on that um, and to hold the UK government to their word uh, on these deals because, um, you know, that uh, that's certainly, you know, there's two issues here. There's obviously you know, an increased volume of product then um, under quota. And let's face it, the kind of quota that they've talked about with Australia um, in particular is so large, uh, they might as well not be a quota because they, they'll never fill it. Um, so effectively, you're talking zero tariff, zero quota. Um, the one, the other way, the other side of that is, um, and, you know, the standards piece is absolutely critical. Uh, from a, you know, commercial perspective, absolutely just a moral, ethical perspective, it's critical. Um, the other side of it is that, um, you know, the, the global beef market is not particularly well supplied. And, you know, in terms of the targets for uh, those uh, uh, those um, countries, they will be highly focused on uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, North America. So I think it's important not to get too despondent um, on this. Um, but it is really, really important to keep the pressure on the UK government. And you know, I suppose I'm speaking here to uh, farmers union colleagues that may be joining us. Keep the pressure on the UK government because they do listen to farmers in this. 
um, or at least they should, uh, and they certainly listen more to farmers than they will to processors. Um, and also on retailers, because the one thing we have seen has been a fairly dogged loyalty by retailers to UK origin product for the most part. And um, I think that's critical. And this is exactly where progress in this whole supply chain side of things is so important. Because if we can demonstrate that we're delivering to meet with their corporate objectives, it makes it very, very difficult them, for them to switch supply to a, a third country operator, to a country that isn't operating to the same standards. Very hard to justify that to a consumer or indeed to the BBC, um, given their, uh, you know, their current agenda. Um, well, what seems like an agenda. Um, and um, so I think, I, think, I think that probably sums up my views on it. Thanks, thanks for that, Connell. I'm not sure, Sam, from a, a farming perspective, if you want to add anything to that um, in terms of the, these deals and, and I suppose what, what you're hearing on the ground from, from, from other farmers and concerns or reservations. Very, very disappointing, Ian, that uh, it's very disappointing, Ian, that, uh, you know, the Prime Minister and, and his mates have done these deals um, without without recognition to what the farming unions um, have, have wanted. We've always said all along that um, we need to have they need to have the same standards. Like we have welfare standards second to none in the world. Um, you know, when you see the treatment of livestock coming from Australia of boats, live live animals into Malaysia, uh, sheep into and the Arab Saudi Arabia countries, you know, it's 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 ab ab abhorrent. And the videos that some of the, the vegans are pandering about on on YouTube and all are of these animals going to those countries. Um, and it's nothing to do with the, the Northern Ireland or the UK um, welfare status. We have the best welfare status in the world, and that's something I think um, we should be highlighting um, to our consumers. But it's a double-edged sword. We could put them off um, buying red meat by, by association. Uh, but, you know, the welfare standards and the treatment of livestock is, is the number one thing um, on a consumer's list and green agenda. And, and we can we can tick both boxes in, in, in great abundance. And that's I think we should play on that. Yeah, thanks for that, Sam. And maybe, Sarah, I'll, I'll come on to you then. There was a, a couple of questions um, around the, I suppose, the grass-fed beef in particular, I suppose, is the first one. Will, will factories pay a premium price for beef fed on a grass-fed diet and, and killed at an earlier age? I suppose there's, there's two parts to that, I suppose, there's the grass-fed and the younger age, I suppose. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, at the end of the day, it comes down to what do our customers want? And there is obviously a, a drive for it. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. What premium that attracts in, in the marketplace is still to be determined. Um, where it sits in the tierings that all our customers have, because at the end of the day, our customers are dealing, or our, our, yeah, our retail customers are dealing with consumers who have very different aspirations of where their money is going on their weekly shop. So we, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we are, we're still competing in, in a protein market. So why, why do consumers want to buy uh, red meat over, over white? But what can they actually afford? And we've got to be very careful that we don't price ourselves out of the market too, because there's an element of, that inflation is going to be going up. We've got to pay for all the good stuff that's happened during COVID. Great. Um, the reality is that food is going to become more expensive. I think we heard um, various uh, food businesses this week even talking about that. So where where it all sits in the, the tierings that our customers have, they've got to make an offering for, for every customer, whether that be the really affluent ones or the, or the not so affluent ones. We want to make beef affordable so everybody can have something somewhere. So we are trying not only with the ranging where where does grass fed sit within that, but also the offerings, how we cut the beef. How do we offer that consumer that really wants a steak but can't afford it? What can we do for that? So there's a lot of innovation going on behind the scenes as well to try and keep beef front and center of, a, of the plate. We're always challenged by um, various people with other thoughts. I'm not going to name them, but they have other challenges. But the reality is they are still a very small part of the market and they just happen to have a loud voice. I think what we saw at the start of the year with AHDB and their We Eat Balance campaign, I don't know how much that filtered down into um, Northern Ireland, but 
that was really positive because not only did that actually put farming in front of a very commercial audience, it actually won through on the, the challenges that came at it from various movements um, in an advertising context. So we're starting to change the dialogue, but again, it means we have to work together to tell the story. And it's not just telling the story, it's having the evidence, being able to talk about the vitamins in um, the beef, the nutrient density of beef, when we, we're not comparing apples with pears with some of these other products, but we need the evidence. And I come back to what I said at the start about being able to measure it, to share that information and be open about what we do as an industry and what great product we actually have. Where that then sits in their tierings, we've got to work with our customers to be able to fit that in. So I can't say that there will be a, a premium or, or not, but I think it will be more of a premium offering because the more we ask farmers to do, the more we've got to reward that, that activity. Uh, th thanks for that. And uh, I see Sam put his hand up there. But interesting, just uh, I was on a, a webinar yesterday, actually, like it was in Best and I hosted it just and there was a speaker talking about the environmental consciousness of UK consumers. And at the moment, you know, based on survey, um, you know, in terms of the those who care the most about sustainability, 29% of UK consumers were considered eco-actives in terms of those who care most. And they reckon by 2030, 62% of UK consumers will be in that category. So, you know, there's a huge sort of job of work for us all to do just in terms of telling that story. And certainly the introductory video at the start of tonight's presentation was certainly is what we're, some of the effort we're trying to do in that space as well. But Sam, I'll maybe ask you, you, you had your hand up there just yeah. to make a comment Thank on you. that. Just to comment on that. Um, I think that the, the white meats, as we call them, um, will have less of an advantage going forward than the red meat because the price of meal predominantly barley fed or grain fed and the grain is reaching all time high. So uh, I think some of the supermarkets have been heard to say there'd be no more three pound chickens. Uh, so that, that also helps helps the red meat industry. I do honestly believe that um, we'll have to look closer at our type of breeding stock um, and have easier finished animals. Um, you know, and, and, and a better weight actually, but it's, it's the finishing of these animals um, for supermarket specs with the right condition on them. I think we're going to have to look at our breed types. Um, and it's, it's a job of work from genetics and a job of work for breed societies as well going forward. And I think that has to be looked at. Thank you. Oh, right, Connell, do you have your hand up as well? Yeah, and, and I think I just, what Sam said there, I just want to pick up on that. I think that's all part of the one agenda. Um, that's all part of the sustainability agenda. It's that um, there's work here on like, animal health and welfare. I've done sterling work over the last year, eradicating, uh, working and eradicating uh, BBD. Um, that actually, um, you know, there's evidence to show that that actually makes a big contribution towards reducing your carbon footprint as well of the beef. Um, likewise, with the genetics. Genetics has a role to play both with respect to, you know, improving the age at which you can, or reducing the age at which you can finish cattle, and then if you can get them away earlier, it reduces the carbon footprint too. But it's it's a it's a dual um, um, uh, approach. Back to the same point, uh, the win-win, and I think that is the one thing we need to take out of this evening is that whatever we do here, we have to demonstrate the ability to, that we can produce food, um, we can produce it, uh, we can feed the nation, but we can do it at the same time by, with, as, as we reduce our carbon footprint. And I think as an industry, there's an onus on us to actually set, put, the, put the structures in place to enable that collaboration, um, you know, to really focus that collaboration. I think there's at times where we're slightly fragmented and if we can reduce the level of fragmentation across with so many bodies, with so many initiatives, and, and they're all fantastic and brilliant people in the industry, and including yourselves in LMC. Um, I think pulling all that together um, um, and, 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 and you know, integrating our systems and our data um, and our initiatives, we have real power, real potential, and we can make it easier for, you know, we can make all this work um, easier on the farmer as well. And I think we also need to work with other sectors as well, because, you know, any farm that we do a carbon audit on for beef, there's a good potential that there's uh, a need for a carbon audit for dairy, for pork, for poultry, for arable, for 
for horticulture. We need to look at all of that. And we need to do this in a very, very smart and clever way. Thanks a lot, Colin or Connell. And I'm conscious it's 25 past. We have another five minutes to try and get through a few more questions. But Kristen, you mentioned dairy there. I know certainly it's a, it's a question that has come in tonight and particularly around the whole area of efficiency. You know, and, and there's a question that's come in here saying that our, our beef industry is highly dependent on dairy bread stock, which maybe aren't as efficient converters of feed to meat. And I suppose what can we really do on, on that front? Um, I guess maybe Sarah, if you want to pick that up in, in the first instance. Uh, I'm sure you've got a fair bit of dairy <laughs> bread beef coming through your own your own business. Yeah, and, I, and I'm surprised the dairy beef comment didn't come up before now, but um it, it's hard to to divorce some of the I suppose the productivity of animals. When you look at the dairy sector, the dairy cow is producing milk, one commodity, but she's also producing a calf that comes to the beef chain. So there's, there's a sort of a dual purpose element to that. If you look at the suckler cow, her main focus is producing that one calf. We've got the, there's a quality debate there, and I'm not going to go into the, to that, otherwise we'll go, <laughs> go here till midnight. But I think we've got to be mindful of what the spec is that our customers actually want. And again, I come back to the consumer miss of who our consumer really is, because what, what we all like for a Sunday roast with a large bit of fat on it and um, what have you is actually not what majority of customers actually want. And I think we need to take a step back and say, what, what do they want? So when you actually put into that carcass that's hanging up in the chills that we're about to put into a, a retail customer, that carcass, whether it's come from a suckler herd or a beef herd, there's very little difference in reality. So we've either got to say, what is the point of difference? And there's a huge amount of conversations being going on around suckler bread versus dairy bread. But when we, when we get into the farm gate, we've got to look at efficiency. And we know that those dairy bread animals are never really going to get to the U gray carcasses. You might get a few, but the reality is that they're not going to get there. But they can still be as efficient as a suckler animal. We just need to get the right genetics the right feeding systems and the right blueprint all together to treat them as they should be. It's the <laughs> all cattle are equal, but some are more equal than others type of approach that we need to manage the different breeds, the different systems that we've got to their optimum rather than treating everything as one and putting them out in the field and hoping for the best. It's coming back down to the knowing what you've got, how to manage it more effectively and making it hit the spec. Um, that's required. And I know we all have slightly different specs because we're all dealing with different customers in the processing sector. That's the nature of how it, how it works. So it's finding the right home for the right product um, at every stage of the chain. Thanks for that. And I'll maybe, um, so I'll maybe finish off just with a, a, a question around just sort of PGA and maybe, um, I'll maybe ask Connell and, and Colin both to comment and maybe even Sam as well. Just in relation to PGA, Connell, you know, what, what value I suppose to be envisage that adding in terms of the Northern Ireland beef beef sector and I suppose maybe a question to follow up with Colin in terms of you know somebody's comparing what we're doing through farm quality assurance as almost like another origin green you know is, is that some is that what we're trying to I suppose develop farm quality assurance into and is that you know somebody has asked has farm quality assurance failed if we need another scheme in origin green I suppose the way it's been posed but it's sort of, I think it's probably just the, the shaping of our quality assurance scheme going forward to incorporate elements like that into it. But maybe ask you, Connell, in the first instance, just around the value in terms of where you, where you see it in terms of PGA and, and our beef sector and, and how, you, how you see that panning out. Um, can I pick up the quality assurance piece first? Because uh, the one thing I would like to say is it hasn't failed. Absolutely not. But it has to evolve. And, um, you know, you know, when quality assurance came in, you know, what were the problems at the time? What were the uh, uh, issues it was trying to address? You know, go back to the really early days, it was about growth promoters and, uh, you know, and providing assurance around uh, medicine uses and things like that. Um, you know, it is something that has to evolve. Um, and it, quality assurance schemes do evolve. Standards, you know, continually uh, change and are increased. I suppose to some degree, or they evolve with the change in circumstances uh, in terms of technology available. Um, you know, this is a probably a watershed moment, I would say, for you know 
you know, quality assurance in general and, and, and the role of um, inspection, you know, is this a part of a quality assurance scheme? Not necessarily. Uh, it's, it's, it's more of a, a, a bolt on, but I mean, the, the facilities and the service that NAFCC provide is a critically important way to deliver that. So I think, I think it's just important just to see that in context um, and bearing in mind, you know, other, other regions of the UK and the world are going to have to get on board and do the same things. We have the ability to do it here. The South has already went there. I mean, this is, um, but, you know, can we do it better? I think absolutely. Um, the question in PGA, I think Sarah kind of already answered it. What is the value of it? It's another string to our bow. That's the way I would see it. Um, it's, um, it's not, um, you know, I, th I think one of the critically important pieces about the PGA was that the Irish uh, government were applying for a grass-fed PGA application, which would have given excuse exclusive access to that PGA mark to uh, the Republic of Ireland, beef producers and processors in the Republic of Ireland. And as a result, Northern operators who uh, using, you know, cattle from Northern Ireland who would be entitled to use that would no longer be entitled to use it. And that was an issue. And it was important for two reasons. One, to protect our uh, access to that. But two, I think it does give us a string to our bow. I think how the value of that is, as Sarah says, to be determined. A lot will depend on, you know, attitudes of customers, but also on, on how, how we promote it and, um, and promote it in conjunction with potentially um, counterparts in the Republic. So, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a, a to be determined uh, question um, there, you know. Okay, thanks for that. And, and certainly I think as, as chairman of the, the Beef and Lamb Farm Quality Assurance Scheme and, and having engaged quite a lot with the industry over the last sort of number of years since my involvement in it, I would certainly agree that the, the scheme certainly hasn't hasn't failed. Um, but um, certainly evolution is, is, is the order of the day. But Colin, I'll maybe just ask for a, a final comment from yourself and then we'll, we'll maybe wrap things up because it's conscious it's just after half nine and we've had a very good exchange tonight. I know Con Connell stole on with Thunder. He, he asked the question <laughs> before he, he let me answer it. But no, absolutely. I, uh, you know, um, it, it, it hasn't failed. It, it does evolve whatever the challenges were we have, we have a food fortress scheme in there in response to the you know with one of the, most, the safest feed supply chains in the world we, we brought in standards to help eradicate bvd and improve our animal health here i think for me it's a it's an industry run scheme um and, and that's critical so we we respond to the needs of industry um and i think quality assurance does that really well and i think this is the latest challenge and um, it's coming us our way Quality Assurance will respond um, to assist in responding to that challenge. And I think, you know, ultimately, just to sum up, this is take this as an opportunity. We have a fantastic quality assurance scheme. We have systems that Sarah said she was envious of. So I think we use those, use those to deliver what the customer wants. And I think we can do that. So let's take this as an opportunity and, and you know, start on that journey and lead the way again. Okay, thank you very much for that, Colin. And, and certainly, you know, I'll I'll take the opportunity just now to, to thank everybody for your your fantastic sort of contribution tonight in terms of your your individual presentations to our, our webinar this evening. And and certainly you've provided us some very important insights into I suppose the wider supply chain um involvement and sustainability and I suppose the importance of collaboration and working in partnership right along the supply chain to deliver, I suppose ultimately the the, the continuation and growth and sustainability of the world-class industry that we have here in Northern Ireland and, and certainly something that we're all very proud of. So I'd just like to thank you all for your contribution for participating in the panel uh, and certainly, you know, those of you who are still on the call and hopefully most people have stayed with us right to the end. So thank you very much for doing that, those who have tuned in tonight and certainly you, you'll, you'll get a survey through um, once, once the call ends, just in, if any of you have the opportunity just to to, to, to fill that in, um, you know, uh, and the link for tonight's uh, recording will also come out to you as well. So if there are any unanswered questions, I know there's quite a few started to come in towards the end of the meeting and hopefully we we'll tried to answer as many of those as we possibly can. I don't, I don't think there was too many left unanswered there, but if there are, we'll, we'll certainly try and answer those and send those out as well. But so hopefully everybody has enjoyed this evening and, and certainly this is the the fourth and final of these webinars and, and certainly from my perspective i know that they've certainly been a great success as far as i'm concerned so thank you all and uh, have a have a good evening and 
Hopefully not too many people have too far to travel to get home. Thank you all.